people are beginning to have a new appreciation of how crucial water resources are and our water is for our lives. Uh, we've reached a kind of turning point, and climate change is one aspect of it, because climate change expresses itself as water. The waters are rising, the hurricanes are coming in, they're breaching the levees. In each case, the glaciers are melting, the polar bears are in open sea. All of these things are about how climate change actually is going to affect us. It may get a little bit hotter, but we're going to feel it primarily as water. We have everything that we eat is rooted in where it's coming from, where is the water that is coming, that it is coming from. And so if climate change becomes water, and if we start to have this involvement with it, then we have, we're at a point now which is as fundamental, I would say, as uh, the New Deal, as uh, the uh, run up to the Civil War, where we really have to have an entirely new ethic. We're starting to talk about a new way of looking at the world. And we cannot reinstall the same elites who have controlled our water <laughs> supply and our relationships, whether it's real estate or major corporations. They are now an obstacle to solving our problems. Um, now, it may be that we can encourage some of them to help us, but it's going to be a little bit on the margin. You always have to try to co-op some people. Um, we now have in this country, because of the abject failure of government and of the private sector, a shortfall of infrastructure construction. That includes highways. It includes our, uh, our sewage systems and our drinking water systems of $1.5 trillion. That's a massive amount of investment. It's not too much for this economy, actually, if we were to turn to it, but it has been a commitment that has been ignored for now for many years under both Republicans and Democrats. Um, if uh, uh, one of the key people who's playing now in this arena of increasing water scarcity is looking at this infrastructure problem with his own, through his own eyes. His name is T. Boone Pickens, or actually just like T. Boone Pickens now. Uh, you may have seen him recently on television. He's spending $60 million of his own money to promote a plan to uh, put windmills in, uh, in Texas and uh, use natural gas for cars in order to create energy independence. He's a supporter of John McCain. Um, but one of the things that has been ignored about his plan is that he wants to take his 120,000 acre ranch in the north of Texas which is at the southern end of the Ogallala Aquifer, which is the aquifer which provides the water for a great deal of the agriculture in the Plains states. And he wants to suck out that water and send it by pipeline to Dallas. Now, this is a plan of a private seizure of water on a scale that we have never <laughs> seen before. He wants to sell hundreds of millions and billions of gallons of water and his question that he recently said is, heck, isn't water like oil? You have to come back to who owns the water. And the question of who owns and controls water is something which many people in the progressive movements, including the environmental movement, have ignored. When the people in Michigan fighting Nestle raised the point that you have to fight against takeover and diversions of water, and who has the power and corporate entrance into water business in the Great Lakes region. Many environmentalists didn't want to touch the issue. That wasn't what they, they were talking about, pollution, resource control, resource preservation. Um, but ownership and control actually involved a challenge to the structure of the society, of who is controlling things. And uh, I talked to uh, one of the leaders of Clean Water Action in, uh, in Michigan, said, we didn't get it. Envi the environmental movement doesn't get this question of, of ownership and control. So we're now at a point where we have to start looking at the underneath, the, the basic structures in the way water is dealt with, if we're going to actually preserve this resource for future generations. This is the uh, symbol for a well-known bank, Chase Manhattan yeah. Bank. But do you know what else it is? This, is, their logo is a wooden water pipe. <laughs> this is the way water pipes looked, a, a somewhat of a version of it, back in the 18th century. 
Because one of the things about water is that the flow of water, this wonderful flow, is also something which has uh, been very much connected to the flow of money. Uh, the Chase Manhattan Bank started, started by a guy named Aaron Burr, and uh, later to be Vice President of the United States. He started as a means of getting state subsidies to provide water for a city of New York. Uh, his real purpose was to create a bank to compete with his arch enemy, uh, Alexander Hamilton's Bank of New York. Uh, he barely built any water pipes of this design, but his Manhattan company uh, was able eventually to create a bank, the Manhattan Bank. The use of water to create financial flows is a long tradition in the United States. Uh, and it is coming back into style in a major way. Some of the world's largest corporations were starting to enter the United States in a major way to try to take control of urban and town water resources, drinking water plants, sewage plants, uh, to, to contract out, to privatize their water systems. Um, this trend has been limited in the United States since the 19th century because the experience of the Manhattan Company in New York City was such a disaster. There wasn't enough water to fight fire. Uh, the great fire of New York in the 1830s was seen in Philadelphia. Uh, it was uh, destroyed, destroyed the city. In the 19th century, private water delivery was discredited. But now, and, and the return was, you created a public water system. 85% of Americans get their water from public water systems. Now there was an effort to try to reverse that, and in the city of Stockton, brought in a company that was a German-English conglomerate, uh, RWE Thames, to take over their water supply. They very quickly found severe problems with this. And it was a problem that was raised by their mayor, who was one, the person who was pushing it. He had a particular idea of citizenship, which is the old idea of citizenship, which is, it's now in the 21st century, he said, we have to treat our citizens as customers. And this was his state of the city speech. Now that a small group of people got together, created an amazing coalition, similar to the kind of coalitions that happened here uh, in, uh, to, to fight Nestle. They brought together union people, environmental people, good government people, the League of Women Voters, uh, but they also brought together churches, unusual groups of churches, um, including evangelical churches that got involved in this for the first time. Uh, we've seen recently um, that uh, you know, many of us assume that evangelicals are an essential part of the right-wing coalition. But in recent years, the evangelical movement has split. And they don't call it environmentalism, they call it creation care. Uh, there's a section of the movement now that is no longer going to tolerate the idea that we have a dominion over nature, that instead they want to substitute an idea that they think is the, biblical, the right biblical view, which is that we are stewards of the natural world, of the God-given world. These people also came into this coalition to fight this mayor and to fight the privatization of their water supplies. And uh, in, uh, they lost many times in this battle. It went, they fought for five, six years. And one of the great things that happened was that in the last year, uh, they finally got the privatization thrown out in the city of Stockton. Uh, it was a tremendous victory of an ad hoc coalition of people who threw out and fought one of the largest corporations in the world. And the way it happens, and this is going to have to be a way that climate change is fought often, is that these corporations, whether it's Nestle here or RWE Thames there, have to come down when it comes to water to a local spot. Water, because it's local, gives local people, empowers local people to determine the future of their water supply, to be actual form coalitions that are going to actually have an impact and be able to change the direction of their local water politics. And those coalitions are now merging, merging together and creating a, uh, national organizations. So for example, Food and Water Watch in Washington is now having some success pushing for a new uh, proposal that would not leave mayors dependent 
on international corporations coming in to upgrade their water services. Instead, what they are doing is they're pushing for a plan that would provide a, a trust fund for water. That would mean that the federal government, as they did when the Clean Water Act passed in the 1970s, will provide grants to support local areas to upgrade their water supplies and defend their water systems and to prevent privatization of this most basic resource. So we can talk about it more later. Thank you.